coalition between these groups. This was thrown off by the fact that the next two large groups that came later in the century, the Italians and Jews, uh, were much less likely to abuse drink than the Germans and the Irish. They had uh, large social control within their drinking uh, habits. And there was a lot of wine that they drank, but it was uh, rarely abused, as opposed to the Germans and Irish, for whom the abuse was sometimes uh, culturally accepted and even encouraged. Well, this uh, entire movement of prohibition started working its way into the schools through state-run public education, which was used then as it is now as a means of shaping public policy and indoctrinating students. And you, you and I both know, those of us who went to public schools, that that continues to happen to this day. And so basically step by step, first down by first down, not touchdown, one state at a time went dry. By 1903, one-third of the nation was dry. There was no alcohol available. And by 1920, when prohibition was final, it died. alcohol use died a quiet death because it had been beat to death for a couple of generations and virtually no one was drinking anymore. And uh, Well, that's overstated. But it, the New York Times said, when reporting on the passage of the amendment that prohibited alcohol, it gave it only one column because at that time it just wasn't that dramatic. By that time, people were just tired of the anti-drinking movement, the temperance movement, which had turned into the prohibition movement. Well, so what happened? What happened? Almost everything that the prohibitionists claimed didn't happen. It didn't have a big effect on crime or anything else. In fact, crime exploded. The gangster era that we know of in Chicago was all about running alcohol, NASCAR, as we know it, came about through souped-up cars in the South that ran alcohol. The Kennedys, of course, got a lot of their their uh, family fortune through alcohol. They were part of that whole Irish thing that uh, the prohibitionists were fighting against, the Irish establishment that had started to take over some of the politics in Massachusetts. And uh, independent researchers say that prohibition cut alcohol use 30 to 50 percent just because it was so hard to distribute it because you had to do it secretly. It never got it down below 50% of the use before prohibition. One of the unintended uh, consequences, and there are always unintended consequences of any time you try to meddle with a large, complex system like a society, is that uh, it became a status issue. And the truth is that uh, alcohol prohibition was rarely enforced among the upper classes. And if you want to see what that's like, you can read The Great Gatsby, and all of the folks at the Hamptons and other places for whom alcohol was a winked at. And uh, basically, if you were of a certain social class, you could drink. And this was the first time in American history where drinking was seen as an upper class thing. So it became a status symbol, which uh, it still is today, especially among my parents' generation. And before that, you would pic picture people at uh, cocktail parties all dressed up that had disappeared pretty much by the time I was an adult. But it was certainly a big thing in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, having cocktails during Prohibition. Have you read The Blackberry Bush? At the moment the Berlin Wall falls, a boy and a girl are born on opposite sides of the world. Do they share a destiny? Do we all share the same destiny? Come on a treasure hunt through the landscape of your soul. BlackberryNovel.com As, of course, with the war on drugs, it became a lot more expensive to fight this with alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and all of these new federal agencies that came about to try to fight alcohol use. It became a war, literally. And it was originally estimated to cost $5 million a year to fight uh, illegal alcohol use, and that was what the prohibitionists said it would cost, about $5 million a year. And this was back when a million was a lot. So it doesn't sound like a lot now, but it was estimated to cost $5 million, which was astronomical at the time. Turns out right off the bat, it was $28 million, and very quickly it hit $300 million a year. And uh, much more than that, actually. By the end of Prohibition, it was extremely expensive. It was one of the biggest public expenses was fighting the uh, use of alcohol and uh, trying to get it to stop, which was almost impossible because you don't need a lot of technology to uh, you need grain, you need grapes, and uh, don't need a whole lot more. 
and a little still here and there, and you've got it rolling. So it was almost impossible to stop. Before Prohibition, only three states had uh, drinking ages at all. You heard me right. Only three states had drinking ages at all. That was Washington in 1877 at age 18, Georgia 1895 at age 21, and Wisconsin 1866 at age 21. And those were not really enforced. They were sort of just on the books because parents were seen as the people in charge of their children's behavior, which, of course, changed in the progressive era. So why do we have a drinking age at all? Because we believe that the state is better at determining when young people should be able to begin drinking or buy alcohol than parents are. And think about that. We believe the state is better at deciding the behavior of children than the parents are. And how did that happen? Now, please hear me. I'm not promoting alcohol use among children at all. Uh, I was not raised in a, in a family that promoted alcohol use among children. Uh, I was not raised in a legalistic home that uh, prohibited that, uh, the alcohol use among adults. But uh, it was very rare to see a lot of alcohol in the house and never with children. And that was something we grew up with as a family value. And so I'm not pushing for the use of alcohol for children. I am pushing for the return of freedom to the United States of America to reestablish a free society. And most of all, to give the responsibility and the authority back to the parents. Now, you might disagree with me. And if you do, I'd like to hear back from you. And there's lots of ways you can do that on my website, davidhouseholder.com, and I uh, would love to hear what you have to say. Perhaps you disagree. Obviously, I'm in a tiny minority in this country who thinks we should get rid of drinking ages. Oh, look at all the terrible things would happen. But uh, the truth is, I think that there would be some things that would go wrong. But I think that uh, there are some risks to living in a free society, and that those risks are worth taking. So tell me what you think. I think we can return to being a free society. I look forward to having you listen again tomorrow and every weekday as we continue our series on life and liberty. Well, that's all for today on Life and Liberty Radio. Thanks so much for sharing this part of your spiritual journey with me. Now, the views on this program are not necessarily those of my advertisers, sponsors, places I work or do business with. They're purely my own, but I'm sharing them with you, so share your ideas with me. Write me on Twitter at Liberty House, L-I-B-E-R-T-Y-H-O-U-S, no E. Until next time, let's continue dreaming and working for a free and spiritually grounded society.